28th of July के करंट अफेयर्स और इस वीडियो को लेके आ रहा हूं मैं मेरा नाम है डॉक्टर विपिन गोयल सो फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल मैं आपको कुछ चीजें बताना चाहूंगा क्योंकि काफी बच्चों के दिमाग में थोड़ी सी कंफ्यूजन चल रही है देखिए 31st जो हमारी आने वाली है 31st of July ठीक है 31st of July तक जो मैंने आपको शेड्यूल पहले दिया था वैसे ही चलेगा जैसे कि आज मैंने 28 के करंट अफेयर डिस्कस किए हैं एक मैं 31 तारीख से पहले पहले एक आपको बेस्ट 1000 का जो है कुछ क्वेश्चंस लेके आऊंगा और एक हमारा बेस्ट 200 का एक सेट पड़ा है वो लेके आऊंगा अगर बाई चांस सपोज करो कि जैसे डेली करंट अफेयर्स नहीं आते जैसे कि फॉर एग्जांपल जैसे मैंने ट्वेंटी का नहीं डाला या ट्वेंटी का नहीं डाला कुछ भी ठीक है तो अगर एक भी दिन का आपका करंट अफेयर मतलब मिस होता ना तो इसका मतलब वो उस दिन का करंट अफेयर नहीं आया उस दिन के उस दिन जो है आपको इनमें से कोई क्लासेस मिल जाएंगी जान की बेस्ट थाउजेंड से बेस्ट टू हंड्रेड से कोई भी क्लास मिल जाएगी बट एक और एक चीज और आपको बता दू कि अगर सपोज करो कि 26 और 27 की अगर आपकी क्लासेस मिस भी हो गई ठीक है तो जो हम बेस्ट टू डिस्कस कर रहे हैं ना बेस्ट टू हंड्रेड क्वेश्चन हम जो थर्टी फर्स्ट ऑफ जब जब भी मैं इसका बेस्ट टू हंड्रेड का दूसरा सेट लेने वाला हूँ तब मैं उसके अंदर वो सारे क्वेश्चन डिस्कस करूंगा तो इसका मतलब क्या है कि आपका कोई भी करंट अफेयर मिस नहीं होने वाला अगर हम डेली करंट अफेयर की एक क्लास की अगर हमारी मिस होगी है तो इसका मतलब ये नहीं करंट अफेयर हमारे नहीं होंगे ठीक है ये आपको इन्फॉर्मेशन देनी थी तो करंट अफेयर चलते रहेंगे आपकी प्रेपरेशन चलती रहेगी हाँ ये है कि दिन कई बार ऊपर नीचे हो जाता है और वो भी मैं कॉम्पनसेट कर दूंगा आपके टू थाउजेंड क्वेश्चन ठीक है चलिए जी आगे बढ़ते हैं तो देखिए जी ये है मेरे डिफरेंट सोशल मीडिया हैंडल्स तो आप यहाँ पे मुझे फॉलो कर सकते हैं फेसबुक इंस्टाग्राम टेलीग्राम ट्विटर और जीमेल आईडी के ऊपर अपने डाउट्स अपने एग्जाम पेपर आप मुझे सेंड कर सकते हो टेलीग्राम ग्रुप के ऊपर जितने अन्नपूर्णी मैडम यस शेल बी स्टार्ट सर यस यस मैम वी कैन स्टार्ट ओके सर A very pleasant morning to all the attendees, faculty members, and research scholars uh, who have joined us today. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome uh, you for a one-day national-level webinar on eco-linguistics, organized by the Department of English, unaided, Kansami Kandas College, Parmati Velu, Namakkal District, Tamil Nadu. And it it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all for one second. The live webinar broadcast. today is on eco linguistics and we have with us today dr s veermani sir assistant professor of english government arts college pulitale karu district it's a great pleasure to introduce our esteemed chief guest and speaker dr s veermani sir assistant professor of english a government arts college he is going to give a talk on eco linguistics he has completed his master's degree and a doctoral doctoral 
from Bardidasan University. He had been teaching in English for more than 15 years as assistant professor at St. Joseph College, Trichy, Arinyaranna Government College, Namakal, and presently associated, associated with the Government Arts College, Pulitale. Dr. Virmani sir has published more than 20 papers in national and international journals and authored two books. He has received a number of awards for his quality uh, teaching and he has also been a research person and shared sessions in over 30 conferences. He is also a recognized research advisor, doctoral committee member and external examiner for research scholars, editor and member and a reviewer in international journals and professional bodies. And 28 July 2015, Sir has joined his government service. That's why he, for remembering this day, he allotted his time uh, to give lecture for us. Thank you so much, Sir. Thank you, thank you. We are all very pleased to have you, Sir. And now I welcome you to take over the forum. Over to you, Sir. Uh, thank you, Professor Annapurni for- uh, Thank you, Sir. Uh, having given an elaborate introduction uh, about me to this uh, forum. Uh, really, I'm very uh, happy to meet uh, all the participants uh, on this particular day. Yes, uh, my dear friends, my dear participants, uh, present uh, uh, today's topic is uh, eco-linguistics. Eco-linguistics is, uh, uh, it is, uh, uh, what should I say? It is, uh, we find that uh, linguistics is associated with the psychology. It is associated with the, is my screen visible, madam, first of all? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, linguistics is associated with the psychology. Linguistics is associated with the sociology, that is social linguistics. And uh, uh, it is associated with the neurology, that is neurolinguistics and so on. But here, Whereas this uh, eco-linguistics, it is associated with the environment and ecology, especially the animal livings. Uh, so we people, we are living in anthropocentric made uh, world, anthropocentric made language. So in this particular anthropocentric made uh, language and world, we are not giving importance to ecology and uh, environment especially the animal beings and so on. So that is the point here. I would like to make a mention of that. Uh, and um, uh, this is the my uh, first point to say about eco-linguistics. And then uh, we can pass on to the next uh, slide that is, uh, first of all, we must have certain objectives of each and every uh, program that objectives will give certain ideas about the topic or the title in which we are going to enlighten the people. So the objectives here, I would like to give you is, this eco-linguistics is giving importance to environment and the freedom of animals. And the second point under the objectives is, geocentrism versus anthropocentrism. We are people using only the anthropocentric language, not that geocentric made, okay? We are going to talk about the geocentric concept, how anthropocentric made language is devaluing and demeaning nature and environment, especially the animal world. Okay, and another point under the objectives, we have, that is a, a degrading language and demeaning nature, especially the animal world. Degrading language in the sense, it is a kind of a gray language. I use that gray language. The language which uh, demeans the value of uh, nature. It demeans the value of uh, animal. So that we can call this particular concept in a language that is a gray language. And another point under the objective we have is eco-linguistics presents the entities of nature and animal beings with the green language. When we 
are not using the gray language, the green language that is uh, flourished. Okay, so this is the point. So these are all about the objectives. I'm going to tell you a little by a little, I would like to expand the objectives, okay, in the forthcoming slides, little by little. Now we have that, uh, this one, uh, a prefatory note towards eco-linguistics. Actually, linguistics can be divided into two. Number one is a system of endolinguistic signifier, and the second one is system of exolinguistic signifier. Under this system of endolinguistic signifier, we have the structural mode of linguistics. Say, for example, the structural mode of linguistics are, uh, is, I mean, the linguistic signifiers, okay? The linguistic signifiers are um, phonology, morphology, morphology of a language, phonology of a language, and uh, the syntax of language, semantics of language. These are all called only endo linguistic signifier, but it doesn't have anything to do with nature. Okay, but it talks about only the linguistic aspects, only the structural point of view. But whereas the system of exo linguistic signifier is nothing but it, it is uh, involved with the the other area of study, like uh, as, uh, as I told you earlier, psycholinguistics, sociolinguistic, ecolinguistics, and neurolinguistics, and so on. So here we have that ecolinguistics right now. Now we are going to have certain points about what is ecolinguistics and so on. Here we use that. Uh, <coughs> Uh, vocabulary influences a physical and social environment and vice versa. That is the point. Vice versa in the sense, the physical condition of uh, environment and social condition of environment will influence the people's vocabulary. At the same time, the vocabulary used by the speaker or the people, it will influence physical and social environment. So what I tell you is it is an, uh, what is, what should I say? It is a kind of a vice versa analysis. Vice versa analysis takes place in this uh, selection of vocabulary. Okay. And you know that he is a very, very uh, famous linguist and um, his uh, contribution is very important in the field of uh, language. That is uh, Mr. Edward Sapper. In his uh, uh, essay called Language and Environment in 1912, he talked about the environment. It is uh, not simply about the environment where we are living, but it is uh, consisted of uh, the, the physical and social surroundings. The physical environment is nothing but the nature, the trees, okay, and then uh, uh, mountains, valleys, these are all called the physical environment. But the social surroundings in the sense, we are living with the certain forces like uh, religion and your uh, uh, institutions and so on. So this is what we call the social surroundings. So what is said is uh, clearly and uh, as 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 Chrysler is clear, uh, we, we, he says that uh, um, uh, that is uh, Edward Sapper said uh, the uh, language and environment is uh, concocted with um, physical and uh, social surroundings. Okay, so in 1912 itself, he said that this is the language and this is the environment and so on. But in the 21st century, we are going to uh, practice it in our day-to-day -day conversation as well as in our day-to-day -day research in ecology and in animal studies and so on. Okay, yes. The next point I would like to tell you is uh, the tramp in his uh, first book that is Ecologic and Angustic, that is Ecological Linguistics. It is said that. And in 1990 itself, he uh, said about ecological linguistics. And then this idea is taken from this Fink, Fink's idea. He is also a great linguist. In 1983, he 
talked about the ecology and linguistics and so on. Okay, and uh, Trump is also uh, giving much more uh, um, uh, points to develop eco linguistics and so on. But whereas here you find that the Renaissance, uh, you would have uh, come across the points and um, uh, much more relevances to the Renaissance even today. Even today, uh, in the sense, Renaissance uh, witnessed the industrial revolution and agrarian revolution, and especially the industrial revolution, we can say that, and then the knowledge level development was there in Renaissance period, because most of the books on language, most of the books on knowledge and the human mind were published during the year Renaissance and so on. Okay, and then after that, because of the influence of a uh, uh, renaissance, because it talked to only about the knowledge and industrial revolution. The romantic writers, they were fond of rendering a constant adoration towards nature. Okay, they wanted to say uh, constant adoration towards nature, first of all. Nature is to be given importance. The nature is to be adored. Nature is to be, um, uh, that is the uh, way in which we have to live in. So nature is the way in which we are, we human beings are living in. So that is the point expressed by the romantic writers through their uh, writings on nature and so on. So this, I'm talking about the evolution of uh, eco-linguistics. So how eco-linguistics has been evolved during um, the human uh, and anthropocentric era. Anthropocentric era, I very often use the word anthropocentric rather than the biocentric. But hereafter, after the eco-linguistics and the, after this uh, COVID-19, we have to use that uh, biocentric language, biocentric word. It is not that uh, uh, anthropocentric made, even if it is uh, um, created by a yeah, man, I mean human being, that language should be um, uh, referring to and representing towards the nature and so on. And about eco-linguistics. Eco-linguistics, it is beyond uh, syntax semantics, as I told you earlier, uh, in the very first slide, I told you that is it is beyond the syntax semantics and pragmatics. It is a practical way of uh, um, using language and so on. These uh, eco-linguistics is to uh, create more concern about the empirical investigation. What is empiricism and empirical knowledge? The empirical and empiricism is nothing but uh, the uh, practical knowledge, okay? The knowledge by your own experience is called empiricism, okay? Jean Locke is the first person who talked about the empirical knowledge and empiricism in the world. Okay, like that, we have to innovate the empirical knowledge, which are uh, useful to the, uh, what should I say, eco ecology and environment, and the physical environment, rather than the social environment, we are going to give only the physical environment and so on. And then we find appropriate theories of language. It is not that simply using this theory, uh, it's like uh, grammatical, I mean, grammar translation method in a language and uh, uh, what is a direct method in language, indirect method in language. It is not like that, but it is to find out a new theory of a language which will, uh, 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 what should I say, uh, preserve ecology, which will preserve environment and so on. And the second point is, about eco-linguistics, we have the, um, it is a study of language system as well as the text. It is not that simply the study of a language, but also how texts are created with the use of uh, the green language. With the use of green language, it is not like a uh, um, gray language, but it is here green language. Green language in the sense, we find that it is the language which is, uh, uh, you, which is made by euphemism, euphemistic technique, okay? Euphemism takes uh, a vital role to play 
in this eco linguistics okay the another point is it is the study of universal features of language relevant to the ecological issues so relevancy must be there in the ecological issues the language should not be uh, only the gray point of view if it is uh, evolved during the uh, centuries and down the centuries this kind of a language is used to represent uh, ecological issues and so on so that is not that idea here what uh, eco linguistics says okay the eco linguistics says that the language must be reshaped and relexified relexified according to the present ecological issues and so on so that is the point it says uh, uh, for to explain about what is eco linguistics the another point that is the fourth point is it is the study of individual language with regard to such features it is a contrastive approach actually certain language certain points will not be uh, relevant to the e uh, sociological i mean uh, this ecological issues okay but it can be sociological issues but that language is not for the ecological issues and so on so the language the individual language the individual language can be uh, english is an individual language and hindi is also an individual language and tamil is also an individual language so according to the language respectively that language should be very very precise to and is address the environmental issues to represent ecological crisis and ecological issues and so on so that is the point i would like to tell you about eco linguistics certain uh, i i would like to give you in this course of uh, uh, webinar three examples i would like to give you so that three examples definitely will um, make you understand what is the real eco linguistics and how uh, we can contribute ourselves to develop eco linguistics and so on here it is to achieve uh, capra is uh, quoted here and it is to achieve eco literacy now we have a computer literacy program now we can have that environmental studies environmental studies that talks about only the uh, uh, what, that thing about uh, environmental knowledge that are uh, given to human beings that are given to students okay environmental knowledge is that are given to uh, students but whereas here eco literacy is nothing but how language can be used to refer to the ecological issues okay the language part of view is called eco literacy hereafter uh, it may uh, some of the universities can have the eco literacy as a paper because still we have a many more problems in the society we have many more problems in the society about um, uh, this um, what should i say uh, the language aspects and so on so that is the point i would like to tell you and then teaching ecological thinking to children and adults as i told you that is this eco literacy is to give as a core subject okay core subject to teach children and adults in colleges okay because how language is involved in uh, environment okay environment and ecological issues and so on a language to have a life purpose okay life purpose and uh, you find that they are metaphorical and aspects of human behavior you find that it is a language is not that is simply a, it is a tool to communicate a person's emotions and person's views and points they want to communicate to one to another it is not like that but language also okay has life purpose and form and aspects of human behavior it is uh, uh, told by i uh, in our hagen uh, you find that it is a kind of a, a human behavior how human behavior is um, taking place 
to modify the language according to that particular person. Okay, so that is the point here. It is a language has a life, purpose and the form. Yes, the next point I would like to tell you is, you find my dear friends, Darwin says, the struggle for existence and the struggle for existence and a person's membership, he, his ecological behavior. It is also quoted by Hollingshed in 1947. What does it mean is, I, you, you would have heard about the Darwin uh, uh, ideology, Darwin's ideology that is the survival of the fittest. You would have heard that in the origin of a species, he talks about the survival of the fittest. Okay, what is that the survival of the fittest? How a human being is to use language according to the environment. So that is the point here. So that survival of the fittest, that idea can be interpreted, that can be used in various ways accordingly. Okay, but here in this eco-linguistics, we can say that it is a struggle for existence. When the person is not able to struggle it is because of the destruction of uh, nature and uh, the destruction made by nature, I use that made. Nature has a uh, life, nature has, uh, um, what should I say, uh, a kind of a destroying measure and everything it has. That is why I use the word that is made. It can make, nature can make. Okay, that is the point here I would like to tell you is eco-linguistics. So it is a survival of the fittest, how a person is going to uh, make use of uh, and represent his uh, uh, ecological perspectives and uh, language and so on. It is a kind of very wise words a point. And then Ferguson says, every language has the high order of meaning and low order of meaning in the same language in the same language, in the same concept. That is what Ferguson called diglasia. Diglasia in the sense, the yeah, same concept has high order and low order of uh, uh, representation. So we can have that uh, both the orders in the same language. So that a high order can be devalue the nature, sorry, uh, the low order can be uh, devalue, devaluing the nature, but a high order can be um, uh, giving a reverence to the nature and so on. So that is the point. Yes, the next thing I would like to tell you is uh, about the uh, language and environment. So language environment is divided into two. Number one, physical environment. Number two, social environment. So now we have physical environment. What is physical environment? There's a physical environment that uh, uh, in, uh, I mean, concords with, uh, uh, consists of uh, weather cost and valley, plain, plateau, mountain, climate, and amount of rainfall. You find that amount of rainfall, that is for the sake of a business oriented. That is why here I have a high in, I mean, a highlighted the point here that is a economic basis of human life. That is from flora and fauna. Okay, it is because of the amount of rainfall. When the amount of rainfall is high, the profession that is a business is also in a very high okay in a high amount in a high perspective that is why it is the physical environment is a kind of a economic basis of a human life and so on yes the next point is a social environment social environment in the sense uh, it focuses on society religion ethical standards and political organizations these ideas are quoted by the eco-linguistics reader, language, ecology, and environment. This particular book is edited by Alvin Phil and Peter Mulasla. So Alvin Phil is a very good friend of mine, and he has induced me to take a, a research on uh, eco-linguistics. 
and he has given this particular book to me as a complimentary copy so i have taken all the points from this book only and um, uh, uh, really it is a wonderful book if you have this that book is available on the net itself okay you can download a, as a pdf format and then you can read that is the bible for eco linguistics okay and what he says is a social environment whereas the physical environment is where we are living by but here the social environment is how we are living by so that is the point the social the physical environment is where we are living in but here in social environment is how, what and how we are living in so that is the point so both the things are going neck and neck to understand what is eco linguistics and so on yes uh, the another point is i would like to tell you is heiner hagen uh, he said in 1970 in august uh, you find you read that the interaction between any given language and its environment any given language and its in in i mean in environment and its interaction interaction should take place according to the any given environment it the language is uh, we cannot say as i told you earlier it is mere to uh, explain our feelings language is used to uh, uh, a communicative tool it is not a tool at all i tell you my dear friends you are all um, uh, english professors and english researchers and language uh, aspirants and so on but i tell you language is not uh, that it is not that skill okay it is a knowledge it is a knowledge in the sense we find psychology is there in linguistics in a language sociology is there in language and uh, ecology is there in language okay neurology is there in language if things are being so how can you say that language is only skill language is only used to communicate your feeling and expression and emotions and so on so that is one of the ways okay one of the entities language is used to express one's lang one's ideas one's feelings one's emotion it is a kind of a very very small entity still we have so many researches on this particular language along with the other areas of study that is ecology that is um, what should i say psychology neurology philosophy and sociology we find a number of things that that, that is why we call that language is not that simply uh, a core uh, concept it is not that interdisciplinary but it is a transdisciplinary language is nothing but a transdisciplinary we can say that and the another point from uh, einer is uh, ecological relationship between certain species of animals and plants in the due course of my presentation i would like to tell you how language is used to uh, devalue animal devalue nature and devalue animal the link between language and ecology was established in 1990 only so in the 21st 20th century only we have the link between language and ecology okay before that it was not that but uh, after 1990s uh, we have that uh, a proper link a proper connection between language and ecology yes it is told by aina hagen and an eco ecological linguistics it is a transferring concepts that is why i told you that it is a trans linguistics a transdisciplinary it is not that a simply interdisciplinary when you say when you say interdisciplinary it is one to one so psychology and language it is psycholinguistics it is interdisciplinary but transdisciplinary in the sense psychology is associated with the sociology okay unless you come across the socio aspects of a human being so uh, how they are living in the society you cannot predict the uh, psychology of a person okay only then you are going to use only then you are going to apply linguistics 
in psychology and linguistic i mean psychology and uh, uh, sociology so that is why i tell you language is nothing but a transdisciplinary it is not even that interdisciplinary it is a transdisciplinary yes ecological linguistics the number 4 please now see that number 4 point is uh, it is um, um, and transferring concepts principles methods biologically uh, it is from biologically biological ecology actually i told you here in right just now i told you that it is a trans ecology and a transdisciplinary and trans ideas it is not that simply an interdisciplinary and so on but it is only the transdisciplinary and we can say that okay biological ecology in the sense it talks only about the nature okay nature and uh, how nature is used to um uh, for our living and so on yes actually this takes place by german researchers most of them from the university of uh, belfield so eco ecological linguistics is uh, um am very much appreciated by the german people and they are doing much more research on this ecological linguistics and so on so it is also quoted by mr alvin phil and uh, i once again i tell you that you please if you have uh, this particular book for uh, eco linguistics that is uh, written edited by alvin phil and peter molasla you please uh, have that book and read you will understand really what is eco linguistics because i have have taken much more ideas from this book only yes ecological links number 5 point number 5 we have that ecological linguistics it is the contrast to structural models uh, I, yes i told you that is it, it is not that only the structural point of view the structural point of view in the sense it is only the uh, language and the aspect of language and the entities of language like uh, phonology syntax semantics uh, morphological and uh, uh, and so on but it is not like that it is beyond that uh, structural uh, level of understanding it is beyond the structural level of using but it can be investigated i use the word here it is a fink is quoted here that is uh, i mean alvin phil has quoted here is it is the investigated investigation must be there it is not that simply that is why i told you earlier that is a relaxification relaxification in the sense the old language can be reread and re modified by using euphemism and so on and the, the sixth point is uh, that is that eco linguistics is the industrial agricultural with its techno economic ideology the word production it can be replaced by growing giving and euphemizes taking away and killing and so on but what it is the it's i mean from here we find the starting point of the eco linguistics but the production can be replaced the word production can be replaced but uh, uh, instead of uh, production we can have growing or giving growing or giving we can use that the production in the sense it has no a living value it has no living value so we are going to give living value for environment and ecology so that is why the eco linguistics uh, uh, takes a vital role to uh, play in developing and in uh, uh, preserving the, the ecology and uh, uh, environmental issues and so on an eco ecological is a transfer to linguistics it is a transdisciplinary number 7 uh, that is the point number 7 is makai uh, quotes that uh, that is a transdisciplinary it is a non exclusive principles we should not say that it is a, a non excluded and so on but it is only the transdisciplinary transdisciplinary as i told you earlier that is one it crosses one field to another field and it gives some other field okay so that is the point here in a very simple manner in a very lucid manner i explain to you about transdisciplinary for all 
okay it is not that interdisciplinary but it is a transdisciplinary hereafter in the uh, researches in universities and colleges we have the transdisciplinary rather than the interdisciplinary and so on yes my dear friends the next thing I would like to say is CDA. CDA is nothing but, you please Google out what is a CDA. CDA is nothing but a critical discourse analysis. Critical discourse analysis, which talks about the uh, anthropocentric made language. Okay, the anthropocentric made language is concentrated by ecolinguists. Okay, they are giving much more importance to the anthropocentric language. I, everybody is anthropocentric, even the eco linguists, they are also called anthropos. Okay, they are also anthropocentric made. But whereas here, I would like to tell you is, even though they are uh, human beings, it can be, I mean, it can be used to uh, eco friendly language eco-friendly language and the environmental friendly language and so on. So that is the point, that is the profession by eco-linguists. Okay. And it is a very interesting subject also. In the due course of the time, when you do your research, when you do your PhD, MPhil and so on, you please, you can have this eco-linguistics because it is for the sake of our society. It is for the sake of our environment, how we are going to living in and how language is used to develop ecology and environmental issues and so on. So it is a very valid one. And this uh, critical discourse analysis that rejects there is a difference between human being from the rest of the creation. So that is why I told you, uh, animal beings are uh, not to be included in a human beings life. Okay, so animal beings are uh, exclusively differentiated from uh, human beings. That was the point earlier we had. Okay, right now we should have that animal beings are there along with us. We are not going to disturb them. We are not going to make use of uh, the uh, degrading language, degrading language to animal being. Okay, yes. Why I am talking about animal beings here, but you are talking about ecology and uh, uh, environmental issues, environmental crisis and so on. But you are talking about animals and so on. You may raise this kind of a question during the course of uh, listening to my lecture. Yes, because animals are also taking a vital role to balance ecology. Okay, balance ecology to uh, transient the ecology and so on. So that is why we have taken the animal beings and uh, uh, human beings and ecological issues and so on. Yes, it is a kind of transdisciplinary, you know. So that is why I have included animal beings also here. And then here we find that uh, Franz Bergen uh, puts the question that is how can language be used to shape biocentric worldwide away from an exclusively anthropocentric and a mechanistic worldview it is a beautiful question how can you say uh, shape and uh, the biocentric language but when already language is shaped and uh, uh, produced used by anthropocentric and how can you say that language is for uh, this one uh, biocentric and so on you can ask this that is why i tell you that it is to relaxification the process of relaxification must take place okay yeah godly also suggests how uh, godly suggests is alternative critical discourse analysis can be had and uh, this alternative critical discourse analysis can be the relaxification, rewriting the language, rewriting the words, rewriting the words and rewriting the language and so on. And it is uh, uh, targeting anthropocentric language and uh, Marxist humanism. Marxist humanism, what it, it says is something, uh, human beings are also very important. At the same time, if something is not useful to the people it should be uh, avoided 
it should be avoided that is the point of uh, uh, marxist humanism and anthropocentrism but it can be replaced <laughs> with reformism and so on yes the next point i would like to tell you is deep ecologization Deep ecologization is nothing but the long evolutionary process of a language and its changes and an interactive with the environmental processes of degradation. Yes, it is a kind of, a, it's a long evolutionary process. The long evolutionary process in the sense, it is not that ecolinguistics takes place all on a sudden. It is not takes place immediately, okay? Uh, it, it, it comes from the long evolutionary process and how human beings are, uh, how human beings are used to represent ecological issues from down the ages and so on. And then it is against the surface ecologization. What is the surface ecologization? It is on the surface level and the surface level language is used. But for the deep ecologization, we have the green ads green ads, you know, eco-friendly paper, eco-friendly uh, product. Like that, we can have that green ads. In the green ads, say for example, green pin generation in an ATM card. When we have a new ATM card, you, we will not have that any paper material to uh, re regenerate the ATM pin number and so on. But it can be uh, generate your ATM pin number by using your electronic device. So that is why they call that uh, um, green pin generation. That is the example for ecolinguistics. Green, green pin generation is the example for this one ecolinguistics. Please understand. Okay, this is the green ads and so on. And auto experts and says, uh, here, really, I am very much impressed by Otto Esperson's ideas here. In his book called The Progress in Language, what he says is, you please read out the particular uh, uh, line, these particular lines, you please. Uh, powerful languages actually changed for the better. The species improved as it evolved and adapted to its changing environment over a long period of time. You just understand, my dear friends, it is to um, a powerful language. It should change by itself. Okay. The uh, lexicographers and the linguists, they must change this uh, uh, idea, uh, change the linguistic uh, evaluation, linguistic evaluation. This particular uh, uh, word can be used to the present situation or not. Okay, uh, this is the evolutionary of uh, language. This is the evolutionary of uh, environment. Is the language enough? Is the word enough to express the uh, and uh, represent the uh, uh, particular issues, particular ecological issues and particular environmental issues, particular animal beings issues and so on. So that is the point here. What a yes person says, yeah, language must be ever changing, must be ever changing according to the environmental crisis and so on. So that is the point that uh, Otto S. Person uh, puts forth for our better understanding. Yes. Now we can mm -hmm. have that. The actually, uh, eco linguistics. Um, uh, yes, Beth Slouts uh, in. Uh, uh, in the essay called Language and the Natural Environment, page number 122. Okay, page number 122. I have taken this uh, Ecolinguistics Reader, Language, Ecology, and Environment by Alvin Phil and Peter Melasler's editors. I, in this book, page number uh, 122. Yes, page number 122. I would like to tell you for uh, certain examples for your better understanding of how eco-linguistics can be practiced, okay? Yes. Number 122. Number 122, it is a pejoratives. And after that, we have, yes. 
here you find my dear friends my dear uh, uh, fellow colleagues please uh, uh, just watch my screen here conventional words and expressions on the left side okay on the right side you have proposed alternatives proposed alternatives aborigines can be replaced with the aboriginal people okay not aboriginals simply so it will degrade the aboriginal peoples and a borrow pit can be uh, replaced with the quarry and then um, a drainage line there is a drainage line word given here and that it can be replaced with the river or creek it can be uh, uh, replaced with the river or creek and global warming you find that page number here 113 uh, a global warming can be replaced with the climatic dislocation okay greenhouse effect can be replaced with the uh, climatic dislocation these are all the points given and quoted by alvin phil and uh, it, it goes a short list it goes a short list and man can be uh, used and can be replaced with the people because man refers to only male oriented uh, uh, aspect okay male oriented meaning but people it can uh, refer to uh, male gender female gender even the transgender okay transgender we can have that so that is why we can say that in general people can be used it is a man made man made can be replaced with the human made okay over mature tree it can be replaced with the ancient tree ancient tree is a kind of a, uh, what should i say value is there yeah, you are giving value to the tree it is over mature tree in the sense you find that it is a very old tree it will not have a much more uh, value and so on you will have that kind of a thinking but if you say that it is an ancient tree you are giving more reverence to the tree so that is the point and we can say we cannot say that that is a, a resource it can be said that the farm forest land ocean people river water and so on so uh, it, this 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 list goes um, collection of uh, a few words okay collection of a few words and so on and uh, Timbered, we find that last one is a timbered. There's a timbered can be uh, replaced with the forested. Okay, it is not that a timbered, it is a forested. Why don't you use that forested? You are using the timbered. Timbered in the sense it is only the, uh, what should I say, um, the last part of a uh, tree, the last part of tree. Okay, yes, that is the point I would like to tell you, yes. Here, uh, and another thing I would like to uh, tell you from my own presentation is, the next point is I have given certain examples from Alvin Phil and Peter Mulasler's edited book. But uh, uh, right now I would like to tell you uh, uh, my own expressions and my own uh, uh, examples for that. Yes deep ecologization and here we find that it is uh, uh, <clears throat> it is to protect environment and animal world with the green language so we are going to how is it possible to protect animal world and environment uh, issues and so on yes language has power language has uh, life language has a uh, form so that is why i tell you that it is to protect environment and animal world with the green language. And the third point is it is to rename or else relaxify the words and the terms to upgrade environment and animal world. So these two points are taken from my own presentation, my own paper presentation, paper publication in an American International Journal of Research in Humanities and Art and Science, Social Sciences. So I have uh, written my research paper on relaxification of English towards ecolinguistics. So from these two, I have taken it. Uh, and then ecolinguistics is a Krems idea that is not developed in a single study. Yes, I told you that it is not uh, uh, studied in a single study, but also 
it is from a transdisciplinary i told you ecolinguistics does not propose the development of a process in isolation it is not processed in isolation but also it is from uh, a transdisciplinary and it is from various disciplines are taking place to represent what is ecolinguistics and so on so it is a rather the re-establishment of a communication networks that allow for the revitalization of language as a whole. But it is uh, told by Krem. Uh, what uh, the particular author says is, please, Krem says is, it is not that only the uh, uh, communicating purpose. Language is not only for the communicating purpose, or else uh, it is it is a tool. It is a bridge. Okay, it is a bridge, or it is a tool. It is not only that, but also it is for the sake of uh, environment and so on. So that is the point here, and after that, in uh, towards uh, uh, ecology of world languages. It is translated by Aaron Brown. At every moment, language is subject to external stimuli to which it adapts. Yes, that's why Otto Esperson earlier, I have quoted his own idea that is a powerful language should uh, um, uh, adapt uh, itself for the development of uh, a present situation, especially from the perspective of uh, environment and so on. So here also, what Andrew Brown says, at every moment, language is subject to external stimuli. It is not the internal stimuli of a person, but it is the external stimuli of the, uh, for, for, I mean, uh, the other fields and so on. While anthropocentric attitudes and responses given to wildlife, animals, and mountains, the whole world becomes gray. So this is the point of mind. This is the point of mind. It, the whole world becomes gray. Gray in the sense it is not for the uh, greenish. Okay, it is not for greenish. It becomes only the gray. So anthropocentric language and responses must be replaced with the euphemisms. That euphemisms are also uh, written by human beings. I accept it. It is written by human beings. But though it is written by human beings, there should be environmental concern. There should be the ecological concern. So that is the point I would like to tell you. Yes, the next point is, uh, uh, we can say, uh, still some people, people say that uh, people devalue animals by using the uh, phrases like uh, as dirty as pig, as cunning as a fox. Okay, how do you say that a, I mean, a fox is a cunning? When a person, we people, human being, think, do, and critically think, and critically doing something else, and so on. But fox cannot be a cunning, but it has its own nature. Fox has its own nature because it has only fifth senses. But whereas we people have a sixth senses. But in that case, how can you say that fox is a cunning? So we cannot say that a fox is cunning. That ideology is a fi foisted upon the innocent animals. Okay, the innocent animals are given. Okay, and then another concept is uh, bull taming and cockfighting. And these uh, phrases can be replaced with the euphemisms. Not that simply, this is why I tell you that these are all the gray language. These are all the gray language. These are, these are all not green language. These are all not eco-linguistics, but eco-linguistics in the sense, it can be replaced with euphemistic technique. Okay, here now euphemism takes place. We would have forgotten what is euphemism and so on, but euphemism is still living. It is uh, still, it has its own value to replace the um, sociological uh, grade issues and so on. And what Heisenberg is, a physicist says, observer is the human being, but the observing method is language. The observed is the environment. But was, what I tell you is, if a language is gray, okay, if the language is gray, the observed is also gray. Okay, if a language is gray, the observed is also gray. That is why the language should be green, that the observed environment and the observed ecology will be green. 
okay so that is the point and we are giving uh, il, give, we are giving less importance to uh, uh, environment and ecology but we give only importance to the anthropocentric and nullifying words towards nature so these can be replaced yes the another thing is uh, this is uh, my study. I would like to tell you, uh, there is a, a, a grass called a cheat grass. Okay, cheat grass. Oh, how, how is it called a cheat grass? Actually, uh, in the uh, winter season, they grow up uh, um, after, I mean, the wheat. Wheat, they are growing up wheat. And then uh, the wheat is not, uh, the, the farmer is not able to get the bountiful harvest. It is because of the cheat grass. It is because of the cheat grass is nothing but a weed. Okay, the grass is in its topos. Topos, you know, that it is the situation where that uh, grass can be lived. So the grass is in its topos. That grass is termed as a cheat grass by human being cheat grass as a human being first of all understand my dear friends please understand here yes human being has no rights to devalue the nature okay human beings they do not have uh, devalue the nature and so on the grass cannot uh, uh, change its nature grass has its own nature to uh, consume other uh, plants and so on but for this process the farmer is not able to get the bountiful harvest of uh, wheat. That is why this weed is uh, uh, called cheat grass. It is by anthropocentric language. This is not that anthropocentric language. We should not, uh, uh, what should I say, encourage this kind of anthropocentric language. And uh, um, he takes the vindictive action. The farmer takes the vindictive action towards nature by calling it a cheat. Okay, by calling it cheat, he takes that, uh, uh, it is anthropocentric language. Cheat can take place in a human being, not in the, uh, what would I say, in the nature and so on. Human being can think and human being can react and human being can be rationally think and so on. So in that case, we cannot say that it is a cheat grass. The word can be replaced by any other euphemism, okay? Any other euphemism and so on. The euphemism or else neologism can be used. As uh, grease, uh, I mean, so that it is a grass is a food for our grass hooper. And it can be used as, uh, it can be replaced with uh, anti-wheat grass. We can say like that, anti-wheat grass. Then why do you say that it is a cheat grass if the grass... Uh, really thinks and cheats uh, a farmer, it can be that. But it has its own nature. When the person, when that uh, grass has its own nature, why do you call that it is a cheat grass? And another point I would like to tell you is waste wood. Waste wood and a fiber particle, uh, particle board. It takes place in Italy. But after the uh, uh, a tree is... Um, used till the end, till the end, certain residues are there, certain residues are there, that residues called waste, that residues are called waste, but nothing is waste from a tree, I tell you, nothing is waste from a tree, the people use wasted food, wasted wood paradoxically, if uh, again it is reused to make particle boats, that uh, residues are used to uh, produce are used to create a particle board in Italy. And how can you say that this is the waste? When something is waste, how is it possible for the new one, for the recycling one? So that is the point here. We have to replace these words and uh, uh, it can be said as a byproduct of a wood. It is a byproduct of a wood, we can say that. This is uh, from my own uh, research that is a real exification of English towards equal linguist. And Mary Khan also says, uh, in wildlife profession, here we are going to see uh, the um, wildlife profession, that is animal beings, okay? The researchers, you please uh, read. Uh, I, I would like to read and please understand. Researchers use only the passive voice to conduct research, especially in the um, wildlife profession and so on. Yes, 
how they are using. Okay, you see the language, how they are using. Very interesting. You please uh, understand here. Opossums were live striped. The Texas and the house, the animals are housed. Test animals were provided. Animals were acclim acclimated. And it, all tests testing was conducted. Five quieters were administered. And it test, I mean, tested animals were fasted. And then 24 hours before being presented. And water was provided albumin. Test animals were returned. And the food after the ground tissue was consumed. You see that how long we see that the passive the use of passive So passive is also from this uh, uh, linguistics part, okay? How that passive is used to inflict more pain on animals when the animals are on the laboratory. Okay, when the animals are in the laboratory for certain tests by the researchers, these passive are, are used, these kinds of passive are used to um, inflict more pain on animals and so on. So that is the point. So here, that doer of action is rejected. The doer of action, who is the doer of action? The researcher. They can say that the researcher has done, the researcher has given, the researcher has uh, uh, given the uh, water with the albumin to the uh, animals, to cow and so on. They would have told like this, the narration would be in that way, but they wanted to hide from this uh, language. So that is why the use of passive voice is very much, uh, very, very gray, very gray in uh, uh, wildlife profession and so on. So this is the uh, concept. This is the example uh, given by Alvin Phil. I have quoted this Alvin Phil's idea in my research paper also. Yes, so this is the uh, eco-linguistics as an example. I have given three examples for your better understanding. Yes, now I come to the last part that is a conclusion, but we have to concentrate on anthropocentric made and that anthropocentric made can be replaced with euphemistic language. Number two, the language has a vigorous and it is it has to be respectful and to inflict the animals and uh, the environment and animal beings. And then third one is eco-linguistics has a vital role to play to make the entire world green. So it is your duty, your duty in the sense, the duty of eco-linguists, the duty of language teachers, the duty of uh, language researchers, they can make use of uh, the eco-linguistics uh, perspectives to uh, bring out the ecological issues and environmental issues and so on. So, and then the lexicographers should, um, uh, uh, with the social responsibility, they can, relexification re re can be done. Okay, the relexification can be done by the lexicographers and so on. So with this, I conclude my presentation. It's a very, very short presentation. And if you have any queries, you please uh, uh, let me know. And I will uh, be very happy to answer your uh, questions, queries, and so on. Uh, at this time, I would like to thank the management of this college. And I personally thank Professor Annapurani for having uh, uh, arranged this uh, wonderful webinar. And really, I thank you very much. And I thank all my uh, participants and the fellow colleagues and research scholars and scholars and professors and so on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. We have questions, sir. Yes, yes. As Shrabani does uh, ask, the, what is deep ecology? Yeah, deep ecology is, uh, uh, it is uh, a long and evolutionary study about the, uh, uh, what should I say, the environmental issues and the environmental uh, stages from uh, little by little as these things are taken place, that is the deep ecology. Yes, next question. Next question, sir. What is used of uh, eco linguistics to general linguistics? Yeah, general linguistics. Uh, uh, 
uh, actually general linguistics is only for the communication purpose and so on but it can be the structural point of view but eco linguistics is for uh, uh, i mean uh, it can be used for communicative purpose as well as we can uh, protect the environment by using our language so that is the difference between uh, general linguistics and eco linguistics but the general linguistics can be used to communicate but eco linguistics also can be used to communicate but we are giving reverence to uh, ecology and so on next question sir chandra shekharan asked them, what is green language what kind of linguistic forms other than lexis would distinguish it from normal language yeah actually green language in the sense uh, normally we use that uh, as i told you in my explanation uh, that is a weed uh, there is a weed called a cheat grass so that cheat grass can be the gray language it can be replaced with euphemism that is anti uh, wheat grass that is called green language okay that is what we call green language green language in the sense it should be eco friendly first of all eco friendly and uh, this uh, kind of language should not that anthropocentric language or else gray language should not uh, demean devalue denigrate the environmental issues and so on so like that the language should be uh, reframed that is why we call that green language yes madam next question uh, next question, sir suresh rajan asked do anthropocentric and eurocentric share any common belief system eurocentric or anthropocentric ah uh, yes sir e u r o u e u r ah, yes sir Uh, eurocentric. eurocentric actually eurocentric is the regional level eurocentric is the regional level but anthropocentric is uh, the entire world in the entire universe so there is a diff difference between anthropocentric and eurocentric in european countries in in uh, western countries uh, how they are uh, making use of their language is different different between uh, i mean difference uh, from the use of uh, um, the worldwide used by the anthropocentric language yes so one more question sir swati kumari yes. how can we uh, relate the eco linguistics to eco eco criticism and eco feminism yeah eco feminism and eco criticism we can make use of a, a language actually in the eco criticism uh, uh, how environment how environment and uh, nature are degrading by the language that language can be reused by the euphemism at the same time for eco feminism we people Uh, adore a uh, yeah, woman as a uh, mother mother earth and then flower uh, that is uh, uh, what should i say that is a sunflower the sunflower some people some uh, uh, some writers some uh, poets they compare a yeah, woman as a sunflower because a sunflower is uh, uh, is compared to a woman and sun is compared to a man a man wherever he goes the flower should uh, uh, shows his its head its head and so on so this is why we call that eco feminism so in that perspective eco feminism can be used uh, from the perspective of eco linguistics and so on yes pratiksha uh, doctor how can we practically apply it in research work yeah in the research work in the sense that is why i told you it is not that in a very uh, all on a sudden it takes space but it takes space from the long research from the long research from long run of study we can uh, make use of that eco linguistics uh, to uh, replace the gray language to replace the anthropocentric language so how you just read out the environmental books environmental books and books on ecology books on environmentalism books on uh, eco feminism and then you will understand how words are used okay how words are used to uh, demean and devalue environment and ecological issues along with that you can rephrase with euphemism and you can relexify these uh, words and terms yes this is the point uh, one more question sir yes um, from kamal raishra 
yes. sir can you suggest a few literary works where we can apply this concept of eco linguistics uh, it is uh, literary work in the sense uh, i at uh, that right now i am not able to say that it goes a long list and so on so i have to read and i'll tell you yes okay that's all sir that's all okay uh -huh. very out of time sir yes uh, it gives me immense pleasure to give the out of thanks today for such a wonderful informative session thank you so much sir thank you for accepting our invitation uh, the session was uh, conducted by the department of english unaided kansami kandas college paramati velu namakkal district tamil nadu i first thank the almighty to shower this grace and blessings i would like to thank the management and the principal for their encouragement and continuous support and my faculty uh, for their encouragement and my sincere uh, appreciation and thanks uh, to the resource person dr s viramani sir for your support and for your for uh, you spent your time sir from your hectic situation schedule thank you so much sir thank you thank you madam and thank i you. i would also sincerely thank all the faculty members of my college and their encouragement and incredible support and last but not least the participants without you uh, we cannot uh, complete such a wonderful session thank you so much thank you anand thank, thank you, you. So thank you thank you participants